good to be back this week. Um, we're going to be talking about God most patient, so let's pray first, shall we, and get our hearts in the right place. Lord, we ask you this day that you would teach us about you, about how you are so patient with us. And so, Lord, we ask that you would reveal yourself to us in your word, that you would show us how you want us to live. In Christ's name, I ask these things. Amen. So, I got this lesson because I am the most patient of the three of us. <laughs> Actually, not true. <laughs> Uh, but I am so much better than I was when I was 30 years old, so there we go. But how many of you thought, when you saw this title, and you said, oh golly, we're going to talk about patience, when that popped up, how many of you said, I don't want to do that, I don't want to go through that this week? Well, yes, that's true, and many of us, I read this quote from Margaret Thatcher, who was the former Prime Minister of Great Britain, back in the 80s, I think. And it said, I'm extraordinarily patient, provided I get my own way in the end. Well, the world may look at patience that way, but that's really not the biblical understanding of patience, is it? So tonight we're going to, I mean, today we're going to look at this and see what God is um, teaching us in his word. Now, Miriam Webster defines patience this way. Should be on the screen. Uh, patience is the capacity to endure what is difficult or disagreeable without complaining. Okay, I, I can take it up to that last part of it without complaining. But, and that's very much, this is from the dictionary, but that's very much the way scripture describes and talks about patience. And the synonyms that Webster gave for patience were forbearance, endurance, tolerance, those are the same words we see in the Bible. Uh, and these are the words translators use for the same Greek word, but to give us a, a, a different nuance in a particular verse. And the capacity to endure what is difficult or disagreeable without complaining is also given as the definition for endurance and forbearance and tolerance, which I thought was really quite interesting. So on your handouts, I put the verses on the back so you can flip back and forth. And um, sometimes we won't read all the verses, but I wanted to give you the context so you can go back and look at these later. But let's look at the Colossians uh, 1, 9 to 12, but I'm going to read 10 and 11. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy and thanks to the Father. You know, as believers, we really do want to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And as we increase in our knowledge of God, we can ask the Holy Spirit to strengthen us with the power to do so for all endurance and patience with joy. So you might want to underline that last phrase in verse 11. It's with joy, not with complaining. And that's our theme for this lesson. Patience grows out of our understanding of God's character, just like all the other lessons that we've had in this book. And how do we know God's patience? Well, his immeasurable patience is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in love. I decided there's a reason that this chapter is not chapter one in the book because we need to understand God's graciousness, his love, his goodness, his faithfulness, his all of these things to really understand his patience and all aspects of his character and then we can comprehend his patience more fully. And the Bible describes God as merciful and gracious, this is Psalm 103, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He does not deal with us according to our sins, thank goodness, nor repay us according to our iniquities. And we read over and over in the scriptures that the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger. 
And here's a couple of verses that you might want to jot down. There are just a couple of uh, dozens. Nehemiah 9.17 and Psalm 86.15. And you can look those up on your own later. But I also thought, you know, I, God really never rolls his eyes at me or taps his foot <laughs> or sighs in exasperation. He doesn't um, drag his feet. He's not annoyed with me. He does not try to figure out what to do with me. He, his compassion and his kindness and his love for me are too great for that. And that's the way we can treat people, but that's not how God is. One commentator wrote this, God's patience does not overlook anything. It, is simpl it simply sees further than man. It has the end in view. It has the true insight which knows best. It's not swayed by human emotions. God has the long view. And he's patient with us, his people, as we struggle with sin. And he forgives us over and over and over again, doesn't he? Jen on page 111 and 12 said this, He is slow, slow and patient so that all may come to repentance. That's from 2 Peter 3, 9. God's patience is an expression of his love, and his patience implies expectant hope. Patiently, he is working everything for our good and for his glory. And that's the solid foundation we have to even talk about patience. So how do we reflect his patience? Well, because God is abundantly patient with us, we can respond patiently to all the challenges in our lives. Well, one morning in June, this June, Amy and Trisha and I met to go over this book. We started going through it and, and were hitting the high spots and making assignments as to who was going to teach when. Well, then we were going down the list. We, you know, we take turns. We got to this chapter, and it was me. And I went, no! <laughs> and I didn't just think it. I screamed it <laughs> rather loudly. <laughs> woke everybody up, but I thought, I don't want to do this. I'm going through a remodel. They're, they're still in my house every morning at 7.30. I don't know when they're going to come and who's going to come. And, and uh, we, they should have been done three months ago and, you know, on and on and on, complaining. And I um, thought, I just really don't, I don't, I don't want to do patience. It's not going to be fun. Well, um, I left that, I said, sure, I'll do it. You know, Rebecca, the not so patient, will do this lesson. So I, I left that meeting. I drove five minutes to my house. And when I walked in, there were seven men, workmen, in my small kitchen. The appliances had finally come like four months late and um, to be installed. And their tools were everywhere, all over my brand new kitchen counter and all over my new floors. And I, <laughs> there were seven of them. Three of them, and this is the gospel truth, three of them were, t were um, doing this on their phones with their earbuds in, uh, and all I could hear was tick, tock, tick, 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 you know, th that's money rolling, and I'm going to have to be writing these checks. Three of them were on their phones. Two of them were just chatting over there in the living room, and two were really working. Um, so I was... Rap my impatience, I had been impatient with what was going on, and I had managed to tap it down, but my impatience was rapidly turning to unrighteous anger. So I left. I said, I need to leave, after I told them to pick up their stuff. Very sweetly, I might add, very calmly, I said, I need to leave. So I left, got in my car. I was so mad. I drove for 45 minutes, just drove trying to calm down. I had a headache. I was so angry. Have you ever been that angry at something? Well, I ca then I called my contractor. I didn't even trust myself to call my contractor before then. Bless his heart. <laughs> and we know what that means. But anyway, because I was, the fact was, I was a marked woman. These guys, the guys who worked for my contractor all the time knew I was a believer. They would walk into my <laughs> study they go, why are you in here with all these books? You know, you're retired. What are you working? And I, it's a perfect opening because I could say, you know, I teach women's Bible studies at my church. And so they knew I was a believer. And in fact, the ones who were there a lot 
had really opened up about their lives. Not the subs, but the ones who were there every day. <laughs> and I thought, I can't throw a tantrum. I just, I really want to, but I can't. And I thought, oh, Lord, give me the patience that I really need to walk as you walk. I want to reflect your glory to these men, not my irritation. Okay, I went a little over on that, and I'm trying to find out where I am now. But <laughs> the, the, the thing was, is that is, you know, the key word was almost. I just, I couldn't. They had, because my righteous anger, I mean, my impatience was turning into unrighteous anger. And that's what Jen wrote in our book. Impatience is the gateway to unrighteous anger. And man, is that true. And I could not blow it with one temper tantrum. I just couldn't, or I shouldn't, and I didn't want to. I did not want to dishonor the Lord like that. So when Paul wrote the Colossians, I, I think there were a few people throwing temper tantrums. Now, that may be a bit of um, uh, license or exaggeration, but they, we do know that there were conflicts in the church, and everything was not going well in this new, new body of believers. Look at Colossians 3, 12 to 13. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, underline that, so you also must forgive. This was one of those verses that you had for meditation, and if you think about this and take each one of these words, compassionate hearts, kindness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, Wow, that is power-packed. You know, patience is listed in Galatians 5 as one of the, is part of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, we talked about this when we studied Galatians last spring, for those of you who are part of that group. But the fruit of the Spirit is not fruits, plural, of the Spirit. It is one singular fruit with different aspects. I mean, you cannot just go pick a plum of patience off a tree and be patient and not it's all intertwined with love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, self-control. Now I'm leaving out a couple. But look that up in um, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Patience is woven together. And as we grow in our understanding of who God is and who we are and what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives, the Holy Spirit we recognize is the one who causes the growth and the change. And the fruit of the Spirit, including patience, flourishes. We exhibit the whole fruit of the Spirit. Yet, we also know we make choices, don't we? As Colossians 3, that we just read, tells us we are to put on the new self. And that's an active verb. As God's chosen, chosen daughters, we're to put on compassionate hearts, along with humility and patience. And patience takes humility, does it not? They go hand in hand. Now, I've listed four areas on your handout where we are called to be patient people. Circumstances, people, circumstances, suffering, and God's timetable. Now, we cannot cover these in depth in this short time, but hopefully it will spur your thinking a little bit, and you'll have some discussion in your groups. And I do want to make a note that I'm indebted to Jerry Bridges' book on the fruit of the Spirit, The Practice of Godliness, and I've woven some of his insights into this section, these areas. Okay, number one, with people. Oh, brother. You know, we are, maybe you are, but I'm not always great at tolerating shortcomings in others. That friend who's always late or the one who hogs the conversation, or perhaps you have a toddler who can't say anything but no, or a co-worker who gets on your last nerve. Well, I don't have my book with me, but question one asks, who is most likely to try your patience? It did not take me a nanosecond to write down six names. Yes, I <laughs> count them. Six. <laughs> now, um, Remember, we are not naming names in our group where you may say that, you know, you can identify them with something quite vague, 
But um, the rest of the question asks, <laughs> what wrong expectations might be contributing to your lack of patience with him or her? Talking about expectations. And here's what I responded. This is true confession. I want them to do what I want. <laughs> and then, and I'm impatient when they make bad choices and then they whine about their lives. Anybody else ever felt like that? Please raise your hands. <laughs> okay. Well, as Jen described this, I have wrong expectations. Wrong expectations. And that's when our patience is challenged the most. And so perhaps the biblical, the, the aspect of biblical at patience that is called for here with people is what the old King James Version called forbearance. We don't use that word much, but it's an aspect of patience that means to hold back much as God does with his judgment of our sin. Ephesians 4.2 says, We're exhorted to walk in a manner worthy with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. It's forbearance. And forbearance is just that. Well, that familiar passage in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13 that we hear at most weddings begins with this. Love is patient. And so if we lack patience with people, then we're lacking love for them. The Bible is clear is that we are, both, we are to love both enemy and friend alike, and therefore we're to be patient with all. All? Yes, all. So how do we root out a lack of love that is characterized by impatience? Well, when we recognize and truly understand how gracious and merciful God is with us, how he patiently bears with us his forbearance every single day, then it's a whole lot easier to be patient with other people, to be gracious to them. And we can forgive them. If you know, remember back in that Colossians verse, talked about forgiving them just as Christ has forgiven us. And also, I found that praying for that person really is the thing that changes my heart. When you pray for somebody... Um, your love for them grows. I'm not saying you're going to like them, but your love for them grows and you can treat them with patience and gentleness. So who's on your list? If you only had half a person on your list, I'm going to be really upset. But who do you need to pray for to forgive, to love with patience? Okay, number two on our list, circumstances. So if we need to bear, we'd be forbearing with others patiently, perhaps the aspect of patience required in our circumstances is endurance. And that is the ability to stand up under adversity. So endurance or perseverance, which is the ability to progress in spite of it. So one is to endure is to stand up under it. The other is to be able to progress through it. Now, both these English words are used in our Bible, but they are translated from the same Greek word. Again, the, Bible uses, the translators use different words to convey a different aspect of patience instead of just saying everything is patience. And they simply represent two different views of the same thing, how we respond to adversity, to our circumstances. How do we endure and how do we persevere? You know, sometimes the source in our circumstances, is really people. Like when Joseph's brother sold him into slavery. His circumstance was slavery, but he was there because of other folks. However, God meant it for good. But sometimes it's the loving yet disciplinary hand of God. Whenever, wherever it comes from, though, if we understand and believe that God is ultimately in control and loves us dearly, we can endure Romans 15, 4. <clears throat> Such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us, and the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. As we understand more of God's goodness and love and faithfulness, we can be patient with our circumstances. So perhaps you have an area where you need to endure and persevere. 
for, you need to show God. I mean, you need to pray that God will show you how to do those things. And the third area is suffering. And suffering requires our patience in many forms. I mean, the, one of the first things that comes to mind is physical suffering. And there may be some of you here who really are challenged with this, or you have someone that you love who is. And then there is also our situations that can be very difficult. And we're not going to be able to go into these in great detail. Next spring, this coming spring, we're going to be studying First and Second Peter. And one of the main themes in First and Second Peter is suffering. Um, I mean, isn't that exciting? <laughs> But um, it really is exciting, and we're going to have a great study, so I hope you'll come back and join us. And we'll cover this in more, much more depth then, but I want to only mention two, two aspects of suffering that may be a little different for you to think about. And one is, um, is responding to mistreatment or responding to provocation. Now, in the book that I mentioned by Jerry Bridges, he distinguishes provocation from mistreatment. Mistreatment is often out of our control. So this can um, include ridicule or um, undeserved treat rebukes or insults or scorn even, things like that. And you may not have that in your life, but I bet if you have a middle schooler in your life, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It comes from other people. And provocation, unlike mistreatment, is often under our control. Mistreatment is out of our control. Provocation is under our control. For, ha for example, someone whose actions are often deliberate, but we're in a position to retaliate. How do you respond to that with patience? Well, we need to restrain our anger and not lose our temper. Workman. So in all of our suffering, we remember the patience of God well, number one, number two, his faithfulness to us. He's in the middle of the messes in which we find ourselves. And number three, the justice of God. He is infinitely just. Nahum 1, 3, he will by no means clear the guilty. We can rest in knowing no injustice we suffer goes unseen or unrepaid at some point. Romans 5, uh, 1 to 5 is on your sheet. I'm going to start with 3, though. Not only that, but we can rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You know, at the end of this list, is there a progression there, is hope. That's really surprising to me. But the reason for this hope is the grace in which we stand because of Christ, which you find if you go back to verse 1. And our, our eternal and ultimate future in, uh, with him. And this kind of hope is for the long haul. It, we take the long view in our suffering. So, you know, sometimes our challenges with people and situations, circumstances, and even suffering are all intertwined. You know, they don't stay in their little boxes. You know, they all feed off each other. But all these scriptures that we've looked at are applicable to our learning how to respond with patience. So I encourage you to spend some time thinking about it, meditating on it, and see what God says in his word about our responses. Resting in the fact that God's character does not change. And then the fourth thing that I've mentioned here is God's timetable. And sometimes I feel like this can be the hardest for me. We all have an area. And it may be the salvation of someone you love or the fulfillment of a long-held dream or even the resolution to a problem. How long, oh Lord, do I need to wait? I'm tired of waiting. You know, we see many examples in Scripture. For example, Abraham waiting for a son, for God to fulfill his promises, or David for deliverance. There are many examples in Scripture. 
And so I want to look at Romans 15, 4 again. Such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. And the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. And so the key to impatience with God's time and table is to trust his character, believe in his promises, obey what we know, and trust the results to him. I have a quote on the bottom of your screen from uh, Bridges' book that says just that. You know, we become discouraged when we wait our turn, to, when waiting turns from days to months to years. You know, I prayed for my dad for years. Okay. <laughs> he came to um, visit when I was living in England, and um, he suffered a heart attack there the night before they were to leave. It's a long story, and I can't go into everything, and there were some really tough times. But at the end of this, he became a believer. Everything was worth it. All those years of praying, all those years of asking God to do something big in his life. He came to know the Lord. And it, it was so worth it. It was hope fulfilled, <laughs> really. And at the conference we attended this last week when we were out, Jen Wilkin was actually one of the speakers. It's great. And I thought this was spot on. We often see waiting as a problem to solve rather than a discipline to endure. We do. We just want to fix it. We want to get in. And what happens when we try to do that? Most of the time, it just gets messier. So where, what or where or who are you waiting on God to act? Go back through these scriptures and ask the Lord to show you how to wait and see this dip, discipline is coming from his hand. You know, patience is hard. It's hard to gain, and it's even harder to maintain. But Romans 15, 5 is so encouraging. May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, that's a promise, help you to live in complete harmony with each other, as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. We want to, our lives to be fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. You know, and in this verse, uh, God is called the God of patience in other translations. He will grant that grace to those who look to him and depend upon him for it. Our reliance on God and acceptance of his will with trust in his goodness and his wisdom and his faithfulness enables us to hope and to endure steadfastly with patience, without complaining, in circumstances and in suffering, with people, and even waiting on God. You know, I want to be less like Margaret Thatcher, being patient, providing I get my way at the end, and more like Jesus, who is endlessly patient with his people. My prayer for us is that God will make us more patient, gentle, kind, accepting women for his glory and our good, but really, ultimately, for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your infinite, inexhaustible patience with us that is undergirded by your love and your mercy and your grace and your kindness. Lord, we are so grateful. Father, we pray, we ask you to work in each of us so that we may reflect your patience to a watching and hurting world. In Christ's name we ask these things. Amen.